Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Love Hour. I am your host, Miss Kev on stage, and I am joined by a guest this morning that I am so morning, noon, or night, depending on when you're listening, um, <laughs> that I am super, super excited to have. She is Dr. Sharis yes. Chambers. That was perfect. Yes. yes. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you for if having you me. If you are um, new to the Love Hour, first of all, thank you for joining us. Um, typically, it is me and my husband, Kev on stage, uh, the Kev on stage, who is my <laughs> co-host, but for the month of... October. Yes. I wasn't sure for November <laughs> for a minute there. Uh, for the month of October, I am dedicating it to four women only. That is the series that I am launching, um, soft launching in the month of October with um, OBGYN guests that I'm having the entire month to cover topics, health topics um, that are important to women because that's important, y'all. Yes, so is. that's what we're doing. I'm super, super, super excited. You guys really enjoyed the last or the first episode that we did with um, Dr. Kiara King, where she just broke it all the way all down. down. Mm. Um, I called it med school for dummies because <laughs> quite literally, she took us to medical school. Actually, she just took us to anatomy school. Um, she did such a phenomenal, phenomenal job. And I know that um, you, the audience, will enjoy Dr. Chambers today because she got some really good information But us. Oh, yeah. Today. I'm so excited. Yes. <laughs> so tell us, um, Dr. Chambers, who you are, how you got started, where you're from, all of that. Absolutely. So um, as she mentioned, my name is Charis Chambers. Um, I am an OBGYN. I'm currently in Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology Fellowship, which means I'm getting subspecialty training for younger girls, 21 and under, which allows me to really kind of harness my skills as it relates to kind of physiology and pathophysiology and specifically periods, which is why I dubbed myself um, the period doctor, because that's really where my interest lies. There's so many facets of medicine as it relates to women, you know, pregnancy, menopause, all of those things, but I do like to focus on the women who are having periods, managing their daily lives, and just trying to manage those cycles to live their best life. Oh, I think that's so awesome. I also um, didn't realize this until you just started speaking, uh, <laughs> that uh, the 21 and under would be considered like a specialty yes mm -hmm. and is it because the at this age you're constantly growing your yes. body's changing yes that's exactly right so I kind of liken it to like pediatric cardiology mm -hmm. so when you're younger your heart has a different kind of structural process and function and then the issues with the heart kind of starting at a younger age are typically congenital or something that you inherited mm. as opposed to when you're older it's typically something acquired so over time some of the choices that you've made in life obesity other factors can in kind of impact whatever disease process is taking place. For my younger patients, um, younger girls going through puberty and early periods, a lot of their issues are going to be things that are just congenital in nature, things they were always going to have um, or maybe complicated by difficult medical disorders. And so we've made kind of a subspecialty mm. that just helps to treat those girls just um, with better efficacy and better sensitivity. Oh, I love that. I, I It is so <laughs> fantastic. And I think um, some of the information that you offer will be especially then helpful to mm -hmm. our listeners who have daughters. Oh, yes. And absolutely. they'll be able to have um, conversations that are more directed and um, more productive with their daughters because yes. they'll have yes. a better understanding. Because while we've all been... 21 and under you forget sometimes you do. <laughs> and so to have someone recall some of that for yes, you yes, yes. Um, is really good so you can have a, a better more productive conversation Absolutely. with your kids so oh yeah. I'm excited yes. it's so fun <laughs> yes so um, let's jump right in we're not going to do a that yeah. or this be or th this or that with Kevin Liz because Kevin ain't here mm. so y'all gonna have to add me <laughs> <laughs> And also, I just be forgetting. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay. But send your questions and your that or this, this or that. Send your question topic, uh, yes. questions, your topic ideas, or your that or this, this or that to hello at the love hour dot com. I go through them. Um, I have a ton of guests lined up from now through the end of the year and low key. I'm even starting a little bit into January. And so if you have a topic that you want us to cover, please send it to me because as I'm reaching 
reaching out to guests, I can ensure that I'm picking guests that are targeted to the issues you want us to cover. And I'm so excited because one thing that I recognize, and I think it's actually a really good asset is, child, I don't know everything. I don't want to claim to know everything. Mm. So recognizing that I can be the biggest dummy and bringing in experts like yourself is what makes um, this platform so great because it allows everyone to learn. But mm -hmm. child, I'll be the one learning the most <laughs> in the room. So let's start from the very beginning. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Child, what is a period? Why do we get it? How can we get rid of it? I'm just like, but what is a period? <laughs> So, of course, I get asked this question um, quite a bit, specifically from my younger patients who come in having had their first period and they're like, why me? Why did this happen? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Can I turn it off? <laughs> um, so ultimately, we have periods um, and evolution isn't very you know, politically correct. It doesn't really care about you know, your gender identity and how you want to plan your family. It is to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. That is why you have a period, to sustain life, to procreate, to have offspring. Um, and so that is the whole purpose. And so what that looks like for most young girls um, is going to be around the age of 12, so the average age is about 12 and a half, your body is going to kind of start that process. And there aren't great warning signs for the bleeding itself. Typically, you're in the restroom and you notice that there's some bleeding. You're just like, oh my goodness, you alert the closest female relative and then welcome to the sisterhood. Okay, <laughs> that's typically how it goes. Um, but if you are aware, you can kind of look at the pubertal signs. And so the actual period is one of the last parts of puberty. Mm. It is preceded by, you know, a little spike in growth. So it's typically kind of like a growth spurt. Um, breast development. So breast development typically precedes it by like one and a half to two years. Um, growth of underarm hair and pubic hair and those sorts of things and those tend to precede the puberty or the period portion of things so the pubertal changes actually start with breast development pubic hair and then you're going to get um, the actual menstrual cycle that was That's good kind of a good warning sign for yeah. parents um, to look out for yeah oh that was really I didn't know that um, I started thinking of my own first period story and I'll tell it really quickly <laughs> I was in ninth grade so actually I think I was probably a bit late because I don't know how old you, maybe 13, I guess not that late, yeah. maybe 13 or so. Actually, my birthday is late, so maybe I was 12. Anyways, I played the saxophone and I was in um, a marching band in Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii at Aliamanu Intermediate School. And we were, had a marching event and we were supposed to wear all white. All white. I knew it. All well, well, there were white <laughs> pants and then like an Aloha style, you know, the Aloha Hawaii oh, shirts. Yes. And so I were marching around our like the block area, wherever we're marching. And I'm like, something is going on, but I don't know what it is. Mm. And I get home and I'm just like mortified that my life was such that the first day. <laughs> That I wore my, I had my period. I had on white pants. It yes. wasn't like a whole mess, but it was definitely like. Mm. I wonder if she knows. Is she okay? I wonder. <laughs> So yeah, that was my first period story. That's so funny. yeah, I just felt the need to share that. I've never Thank said you. that alone. No, I love, I get, I mean, I've heard a lot of first period stories. That one's a great one. Yeah, it's it's terrible. Okay. <laughs> so after you, um, you have this period. Yes. Okay. Uh, first, before we even go back or like continue down that path, can you tell us, I just read this recently, um, that there are cycles. Yes. Within like or not cycles, maybe phases. phases. Yes. Phases. That um, comprise the cycle. Yes. So tell us what those are. So it's basically two phases and you can break them down to like histology, like what's happening if you were to look at like a slide of um, the actual lining of the uterus or um, the actual hormonal changes. So ultimately, there's two stages. In the earlier stage, the estrogen is predominant and it's building the lining up, mm -hmm. up, up, up. And then there's going to be release of the egg, which is kind of like the median point, the ovulation. Um, and then once that egg is just hanging out and nothing actually happens, it's progesterone, dom progesterone rather, dominant stage, then you have your period. And so the lining's building, building, building. We're preparing for pregnancy. The egg releases, you hang out, your body's like, are we getting pregnant? We're getting pregnant? we're not and then everything flushes out that's what happens okay that was that's good, like the simplest right? way to say it that was a really good like even visually mm -hmm. like that makes sense to fantastic. to me yeah so that was really fantastic thank you so much for Beautiful putting cycle. that in um <laughs> the most simplistic of terms that's something that people can hold on to exactly exactly 
Okay, so cool beans. So we are we understand the cycle. We understand what's going mm-hmm. on in our body, and then we are stuck with like, well, what products do I use? Exactly. So I am very impressed with all of the options of products these days. I think it's wonderful to have more options than not. A lot of people think there's only pads and tampons. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I grew up that way. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I did as well. I was like, there's pads or tampons. That's yeah, it. That's it. Um, and so we know, obviously, in lower resource areas, people are very creative in what they use. Um, and so there's a lot of efforts on a, like an international scale to provide appropriate products. And yes, I think a pad and a tampon in that scenario, that's perfect. We, we want people to be able to be clean and go about their day-to-day activities. However, um, when we get to areas where there's, you know, a little bit more resources and people are just more conscious of the environment and what they put in their bodies, we have a ton of, you know, options. So not only do we have our period um, pads and tampons, we have our menstrual cups, Mm -hmm. our menstrual discs, Mm -hmm. we have period panties, um, and we also have kind of reusable pads. So Mm -hmm. there's so many more options out there um, than we previously thought. I think some of the hesitations around like tampons, for instance, can be people just thinking, oh, my child's way too young. You know, she hasn't had intercourse before. She doesn't really understand her body very well. She's not appropriate for a tampon, Mm -hmm. which is just not true. So we teach our young girls that they actually can use tampons. As long as you are able to insert it correctly, you have a decent understanding of your anatomy, and you know not to leave it in longer than 68 hours, you can wear a tampon your very first period because you should be able to. If your anatomy is normal, there's nothing to preclude you or to prevent you Mm -hmm. from wearing a tampon. So when we hear a lot of times the hesitation is, sorry, um, the hesitation with young girls using tampons. Mm -hmm. I remember even hearing this as a young girl for my parent or my mom was, again, that intercourse thing. I think to me Mm -hmm. um it stems back to like the hymen yes it's always the hymen i know right (laughs) okay so we talked about this a little bit with um dr king tell Mm -hmm. us what your thoughts on absolutely okay so i love talking about the hymen to parents because i think it is a point that's of high concern but little discussion so that's always that's always tough (laughs) So if you have high concern and little discussion, there's so much room for miscommunication, anxiety, and other issues. Um, (laughs) Mark that spot. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Um, So the hymen is simply a tissue bridge at the opening of the vagina. That is it. By virtue of its presence, it is supposed to be patent, meaning it's supposed to be open. It should allow menstrual blood to exit and a tampon to insert. It also should allow for vaginal intercourse. It may stretch, it may have a small tear, but it does not rupture. It does not create some crazy, you know, traumatic event at first intercourse that people tend to perpetuate. Mm -hmm. Um, Additionally, inserting a tampon, if it is appropriately sized, should not damage that at all. It does not take your virginity, as virginity cannot be taken by a tampon. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it can't happen. So there's so many aspects about the hymen tampons and those things. But what I want people to understand is if you're not comfortable with your daughter using it, fine. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to do anything you're uncomfortable with, but I don't want you to misrepresent science. Science does not support that. And I am a medical physician, so I'm always going to tell you what the science shows. Well, child. I don't know if that was too heavy. But no, it's important. I I don't it's think it. Important. I and I don't think it was too heavy. I think that it, what you just said is so good that there are high concerns and low discussion. Yes. and so we just hold on to this hold belief yes. that they're too young and the high and you you may not even always be able to like string together a story beyond you're too young sex no. Right, exactly. (laughs) And and those are stories most moms tell. We're just like, that's not my right. Right. (laughs) And so I think the biggest thing and one of the things that I think is so important in in like a low key mission of the podcast Mm -hmm. is to articulate how you feel so then they can be properly addressed. Absolutely. And so if you're able to say something like this is why I'm concerned because of this, that or the third Mm -hmm. and your doctor is able to then say, well, let me explain to you Mm -hmm. why that's kind of like not the truth. Let me explain to you why that's inaccurate. And then you can go back and make a decision based on 
fact. Yes, that is literally my whole thing. I want you to know the facts. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't care where you decide, right. as long as you are happy with that choice. But when I'm watching young girls, and specifically women of color, being manipulated and pointed in all these directions, and just being guided by fear and misinformation, that is when I feel compelled to speak. That is what gives me kind of the drive to post the post that I do, mm -hmm. and, and even come here on this platform. I'm just so excited mm -hmm. because this is so incredibly necessary. Oh, so good. Let me tell you what else is so incredibly necessary and important, orgasms. Okay, I and don't disagree. Everyone <laughs> deserves a great orgasm, and Blue Chew is here to help you achieve those dreams because you deserve a great orgasm. If you have your daughters listening, turn this part off, but child, you continue to listen because I mean what I tell you. Blue Chew is the hyperdrive that you need for a successful, good night. The night that you may have been longing for with your spouse because school is back in, you are stressed the <sighs> heck out because you need to figure out long division. Mm, and that's why? stressful. Ask me how I know, because I've been trying to figure out long division with decimals and it is difficult. And sometimes to release that energy, all you need is a great orgasm. And so what I'm here to tell you is that Blue Chew is here to help. And right now, because they are friends of the podcast and I am friends of yours, we have a very special deal for our listeners. Visit BlueChew.com and get your first shipment free when you use promo code LOVEHOUR. Just pay $5.00. For shipping again that's blue chew blue like the color b-l-u-e chew.com promo code love hour to try it for free blue chew is the better cheaper faster choice and we thank them for sponsoring the podcast uh okay so i think that that was like super helpful and yeah. um <clears throat> really just so 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 important so let's go back so we're talking about like the different um I have something in my eye. Oh on. no, it's contagious. Oh, I had it in my eye earlier. There it is. I got it. Okay. So we're talking about all of the different like menstrual products. Yes. So we've talked about like specifically the issues with tampons, yes. which thank you. I oh, think yeah. that that was a phenomenal like little read for all of us. Um, <laughs> but also let's talk about like the pros and cons of mm -hmm. each. And then oh, yeah. I even want to talk about like menstrual cups specifically mm -hmm. because um, I use them and it's been like a whole experience. So let's go through like the pros yes. and cons of each okay so let's start with pads because i think that's just very simple so the pros of pads one they're non-invasive mm -hmm. anyone most people can use pads pretty readily obviously one of the cons is that pad positioning it mm -hmm. takes some time to figure that out too anterior you'll be bleeding have bleeding um in the back mm -hmm. if you put it too far back you have bleeding up front and that can lead to kind of soiling having to leave school and kind of messing up your clothes so pads you know they work decently well but they work on the outside when they feel they can be uncomfortable mm -hmm. you know pros cons Younger ages can use them, people who don't understand their anatomy very well, people who may have some developmental delays because they too get periods, they can kind of manage pads pretty easily. Um, tampons, they're more discreet, allow for kind of more active girls, so girls who may play rugby, they may be on the swim team, um, those sorts of things where they're kind of moving around and don't want to be shifting a pad uh, readily, it allows them to have that kind of activity. If you want to be more discreet, you're wearing kind of a closer fitting outfit and you don't want a pad to be visualized, obviously a tampon is more discreet. So tampons have that kind of benefit. The cons of tampons will forever be, they're one, invasive, and two, there's always that historical reference to like toxic shock that is, is actually like exceptionally rare but still very real and so when something's very rare but still can be you know super high mortality or risk for even you know extreme illness or death it's important to take that seriously and so I think that also promotes kind of the hesitation um, with tampons then we can transition over to like your menstrual cups and menstrual disc and the difference is that this isn't an absorbent material it is truly something that's just catching mm -hmm. the blood housing the blood um, within the vagina so it's inserted into the vagina what's really probably the most important aspect of your menstrual disc and menstrual cups is the appropriate placement yes so girl. if you do not <laughs> place it appropriately just like any any cup anywhere if it is not placed appropriately you're going to have spillage and that can be obviously uncomfortable embarrassing um, the other piece that I think makes people hesitant toward menstrual cups is when you are removing a menstrual cup, 
you're removing a cup of blood. Mm -hmm. And so if you are doing this in a public restroom mm -hmm. and you spill this, I mean, if you're in business casual, just picture yourself in business casual, removing a cup of blood. I mean, the likelihood is just high that sure. something's going to go uh, <laughs> awry. <laughs> awry. So people don't love that. Removing a tampon that is absorbent, it's absorbed with blood. You're, the likelihood of spillage is much lower. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are some of the aspects that are a little bit troubling. The pros of menstrual cups. Sustainability, mm -hmm. like environmental sustainability. That is wonderful, it's reusable. You're not putting out all of these kind of negative products into the environment. And so if you're truly one of those people that cares about the environment, your organic tampons are not quite the best. It would be like the menstrual cups or something that's more reusable that would actually kind of um, be the most sustainable option. Um, and then of course our period panties. I really like that for our younger girls who mm -hmm. have issues with spillage because they don't place you know, their pads appropriately or they just have that tampon to have a little bit of spillage around. They're comfortable, they can still be very active, play their sports and not have to reposition the period underwear. And then it holds a lot mm -hmm. um, within it. It's still reusable, you wash it. I think that's exceptional period. Pads, the reusual pads, kind of um, function in the same fashion except they do have wings that kind of snap around um, the underwear and you can re reuse those and wash those as well. So wait, what is a period panty? A period panty. <laughs> There's actually so many. There is now a period panty that's like disposable, which I would argue defeats the purpose <laughs> of being a period <laughs> panty, but there's some people who just want to wear something and then just kind of toss it. But um, I believe the company is Things actually that kind of started this initially. They created a super absorbent material, so it looks like normal underwear, the normal cut. Um, they're typically darker in color. They can have like a lacy kind of um, band at the very top, and it just holds a lot of liquid within it. It's not a pad itself. It doesn't have a pad like within it, but it just is a super absorbent material that doesn't have the true bulk of a pad and is just kind of discreet. It's exceptional. I wish I'd invented it. I, did. I didn't know that's what it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. It is super. I agree with you that it probably seems like a really great option for, for a child yes. or someone yes. younger. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. actually that's a, something I didn't think about yeah. um, when I have seen the advertising. But honestly, I've never like dived that into like, what exactly this yeah. is? So that was actually a really great explanation. So when you're inserting menstrual cups or yes. menstrual disc, yes. um, the this is what I also think. So I think you hit on something that's really important about the menstrual cup, menstrual disc. When I started using mine and mm -hmm. I went out to like all my friends because I am that person that's like, <laughs> this is delicious. Try it. This is gross. Try it. I'm like that with everything in my <laughs> life. So I'm like, oh my God, this is fantastic. Everyone needs to try it. So I'm like telling all of my friends, I, look what I'm doing. I think it's great. And everyone's like, okay, so first of all, what you're telling me is <laughs> that you're allowing your period blood to collect and then you have to like pull it out. That's gross. <laughs> and then the other part is that there's a huge learning curve. Oh, absolutely. And I think the, um, first of all, the stigma tied to like touching the blood, but then the other part of like touching your body yes. is also yes. like a yes. whole mental situation. Yes. My patients, specifically my teenagers, even when it comes to just really anything, like exploring, kind of feeling the strings of an IUD or entering a vaginal ring, they're like, I don't want to touch down there. I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> that is your whole body. I know you have let someone touch down there because we've talked about it. <laughs> Why are you so averse to touching your own body? I think that goes back to a ton of like generational aspects of hypersexuality mm. and um, just other, you know, religious kind of. Um, ways in which we demonize, you know, sexuality and mm -hmm. things like that. So I can't break down all of that, but I can support the logic that if you are taking good care of your body, if you're taking good care of a car, it's helpful to know the parts of the car. Right. Like, I mean, that just makes perfect sense. If you want to something to function optimally, you should study it. You should know it well. And what is more important to know well than yourself? That's so, that was really good. <laughs> That was great. No, that was good. And I 100% concur. So <laughs> I do, because I think that's the same journey that I was on was yeah. recognizing um, so many people have seen and touched, but yet I'm uncomfortable. Like right. that doesn't that's that, that right. doesn't make sense to me. And so I went on my own wow. journey, which kind of led me. I mean, I do a lot of traveling, mm -hmm. speaking, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And child, having a period when you're on your like traveling, it's just inconvenient. Ain't nobody mm -hmm. got time to be doing all nobody the things. Nobody has you ever said, do. I wish I was on my period. Girl, not never. <laughs> not never, not ever. And so the um, menstrual cup for me has mm -hmm. allowed my life to uh, 
function, so to speak, despite being on my period. Yes. Because even when you're on vacation, it's just it's just it's just an easier process. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. when you're inserting um, the menstrual cup, menstrual disc, mm -hmm. we we learned, or actually, do you want to draw like where sure. our cervix is? Because I think that's the biggest <laughs> oh, issue. Is yeah, is like knowing where to insert this. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna take a break here really quickly and grab things for you. To yes, perfect. Edge perfect. A sketch. Okay, so we've grabbed the the whatever this is dry erase board and she's drawing y'all bear with me we're not going to hold you accountable what i'm not is an artist okay we're going to make this the uterus and we're making this the vagina okay this is not beautiful but you understand This is my drawing. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll see if people actually make sense of this. Um, so this top portion is going to be the uterus. When I'm talking to um, my younger patients, I just say that the uterus is like your head. Okay? okay. The cervix is here. It is the neck of the uterus. Okay? So like your neck. Actually, the spine on the neck is called the cervical spine mm. because that's like the Latin term for neck. Oh. I know that's very anyway. So <laughs> no one really cares about that. But ultimately, it's like the neck of the of the uterus. Okay, so it's going to be the base of the uterus and actually serve as like a channel to enter into the uterine cavity. Does that kind of make okay. sense? Okay. So oh, oh, I, I need to orient myself. Yes, yes, yes. So what we're looking at here is this area. Yes, it is very low. If you have on high waist jeans, it's where the zipper is covering ultimately. Okay, I have on high waist mm -hmm. oh, jeans. Oh, that's good. So we're yes. talking about low in the pelvis. Look, I got any good. So we're mm -hmm. talking about this right here. I think we learned that with Dr. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this here, okay, I'm I'm trying to visualize this because I also heard that the cervix is like a balloon. So the uterus is like a balloon, oh. with the cervix being the portion where it tapers at the bottom. Okay, that was a good visual for me. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> this here, this is uterus. Yes, the larger portion is the uterus. Your uterus is about the size of your fist, by the way. Unless it is filled with a baby. Obviously, it's larger. But okay. <laughs> when, it's, when you're not pregnant, the uterus is about the size of a fist. That's okay. the normal size of the uterus. Okay. okay. So you have your uterus at the top. And at the base of the uterus, it's kind of like the opening of the uterus or the fist or, or like the wrist oh, here. Oh, like this. That is like what the cervix looks like. And so your uterus kind of has this kind of morphology. Yep. Okay. <laughs> This but, is good. Yes. Um, but to look at the cervix, you must look through the vagina. Yep, okay. Got that. The vagina itself, and obviously this opens up to the external genitalia. The vagina is kind of a rugated structure, so it has collapsing walls. And at the apex. It's a potential space. We learned the, that with Dr. It's King. It's a potential space. At the top is the cervix. Okay. And then the okay, cervix leads so to the So we are looking <laughs> here. <laughs> yes. Yes, with our, we're here. the doctor. Let's yes. open this. Yes, this yes. is looking the, here. I don't know what I. Just oh, this hit. is good. So we're. <laughs> this is the opening of, of the vagina. We got vulva. We got vagina. Yes, yes. Okay. Vulva and vagina. Then You're we're looking, looking through it, and at the top you would see the cervix. Okay. And then once you, if you were to look through the cervix, which we actually do during something called hysteroscopy, mm -hmm. which is a camera looking at the um, uterus, you look through here, and you can see the inside of the uterine cavity. Okay, Which I is love why that. the cervix must dilate for the baby to exit the uterus. That is what opens to 10 centimeters. That's why we do cervical exams. Mm -hmm. Yes? That was good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then when we're, this is good. I'm never yes. going to forget this in life. <laughs> like, I'm just never going to forget this. Okay. So when we're inserting our menstrual cup. Yes. Okay. Now we're back to the menstrual cup. Okay. Perfect. Yes. When you're inserting the menstrual cup, you are inserting it into the vagina, but it needs to cover the cervix because all of your period cervix. blood is coming out of the uterus. Yep. Correct. So if there's a menstrual disc, it needs to be at, a, at an angle in which it is kind of blocking the cervical opening. Oh. If it is positioned like this, you're going to have blood flowing on either side of it. Oh, it is meaning not... when you insert it, it's not like a tampon that you insert exactly. this, I got you. Oh, that was good. Yes, it's mm -hmm. not a tampon that you just insert straight up. You need to insert it and then tip it, kind of turn it so that it's actually able to collect the blood. So that's for more for your disc, the disc itself. The I got you. Because mm -hmm. I, I use this. I don't use the cup. because The disc trust. is so great to me. Um, 
uh, I don't know. I feel like my body's too small for him. <laughs> um, okay. So, and we are cupping it. Yes. Beca- I mean, not cupping it. We are tilting it because. You're tilting it to capture the blood. If you didn't tilt it. But what it, is it? It's, what is it holding on to? <laughs> so the posterior portion of the vagina. And then there's a, there's a bony prominence called the pubic bone. Uh-huh. Kind of that's anterior that uh-huh. actually kind of, um, you tuck it behind the cervix and kind of tuck it up under the pubic. It's like, the, it's like a Hoover Dam. It is just not there. unlike a who. Okay, that was good. That was good. Yes. Okay. We'll keep that. That's good. <laughs> Shall we got, uh, what do we have here? Vagina. Yes. <laughs> then we have the, what did you call this? The corrugated. So this is the rugated walls. Rugated walls of the, of the vagina. Because the, the vagina is is a tube, right? The vagina is a tubular mm. structure. Right. We knew that. Mm-hmm. Yep. This is good. good. <laughs> so the tube, in order to block something from flowing out of that tube, you have to turn it to be transverse in that tube. I got you. Yep. Okay. And okay. that's all it really requires. Mm-hmm. This was a great drawing. I hope you guys all go and try <laughs> menstrual cups based on this drawing. Based on the drawing. The menstrual cup is more of like this, and it's just going to kind of sit down here. Um, but you just have to make sure that the actual angle of it is appropriate. I think the angle part is what's difficult. Yeah, it so. is. And it's every body is different. Mm-hmm. Which, when I do a speculum exam, it is different for every single patient. So it depends on how your uterus is tilted and just how close the bony structures are. And so it's important to get one, the right size menstrual cup. Mm-hmm. So I would start with the smallest, unless you just know something else about your body. <laughs> you know, listen. start with the smallest. And you can actually use like a KY jelly or some lubricant to insert it as well which can be helpful. Mm-hmm. I usually line mine with water, but KY gel is a good or option. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really yes. good, Dr. Chambers. Yes. Thank I'll you so much. <laughs> um, I hope that you guys aren't all nervous and hot as a result of this, because sometimes talking about our bodies and doing this kind of work can I make know. people uncomfortable. Um, but if you are, Native is here to help because oh, they have deodorant that is fantastic. You guys know how I feel about these people's deodorant, okay? I always use the coconut and vanilla one because it okay. smells amazing. But did you know that they also have a body wash in the same fragrance? Mm. And one thing that I am always here for is smelling good. And when things are compatible, meaning you put body wash on, that's a scent. Then you lather lotion, that's a scent. Then you have on lotion, I mean, deodorant, that's a scent. You will smell like you have been doused and then anointed. Mm, Anointed. (laughs) With coconut and vanilla. And these are the things that are great for life. Okay, people? So go out and try Native deodorant because try all their products child but specifically you want to try this native is one of those companies that uses ingredients found in nature such as coconut oil shea butter tapioca starch um, and all of these things work to absorb all of that moisture that you want to get rid of so you don't have pit stains um for 20% off your first order, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code LH during checkout. Again, 20% off your first purchase. You're going to go to visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code LH during checkout. Next, I want to tell you about Fabletics. Listen. <laughs> I'm so excited that they are partnering with us on the podcast because you guys know that I'm always down for cute, comfortable clothes. I'm almost like 99% of the time I have like sweatpants. I try to have on a decent top, but um, I'm definitely trying to wear like leggings or just something like comfortable. I have a meeting after this, so I have jeans on. Otherwise, please believe I would have been in my Fabletics uh, because their clothes are just super, super, super comfortable. And I have been rocking the Terry joggers. Anything made with Terry is like that really like soft. It, it's almost like a like you want to just lay in it because it's like a blanket and it just wraps you and it just is a great thing in life um and they have a beautiful collection that they've just collabed with kelly Rowland. and if you Mm. know anything about me you know that i adore kelly Rowland. she is just everything to me and everything that she's um collabed with them on is a may Zine. So with all of that said, we're super excited to partner with the company founded by the beautiful Kate Hudson, a fashion focused activewear brand with a mission to empower women by making a healthy, active lifestyle accessible to everyone because it's exceptional price point, meaning it's affordable. Uh, no matter if you're ready to zen out in hot yoga, crush it in CrossFit or simply take a stroll in the park or child, you just want to have a lazy day because... Mm. 
sometimes that's all you want to do. You just want to put some leggings on because you want to Netflix and chill in your house. Mm-hmm. Um, Net, or Flabletics has you covered and carries gym wear suitable for all types of workouts. Fabletics is your one-stop shop for affordable gym wear and all of their designs are created in-house. Trust me, you seriously can't find these pieces anywhere else. Before I forget, Fabletics is offering my listeners an incredible deal you don't want to miss. Get two leggings for only $24. That's a $99 value. First of all, listen to me. That means you have essentially saved $75. Do you -hmm. know what you could do with $75 that you have now saved? Girl, that's a good, good, good chunk of change. When you sign up for their VIP, go to fabletics.com slash love. That is the only way to take advantage of this deal. Again, fabletics.com slash love to get two leggings for only $24. Fabletic also releases brand new styles, collections, and prints every month. Also, a pro tip, if you guys become a VIP with Fabletics, you'll get 50% off regular pricing and instant access to their latest collections. Plus, the best part is there's no commitment to order on a regular basis. You can skip any month. So if you're anxious to get in shape and feel confident stepping into your workout routines with trendy and affordable gym wear, I highly recommend checking out Fabletics. And trust me, you do not want to miss out on their very special offer. Again, that's two leggings for only $24. That's a $99 value when you sign up for their VIP. Be sure to check out my favorite leggings, which are the Terry. I'm going to tell you all the exact names. They are the Rain Tech Terry Joggers. In fact, I'm looking at my order history and I bought two of them. (laughs) Uh, I also bought the mid-rise Perlex leggings, which are amazing. And I bought a few sports bras. Child, I went on there and kind of went ham. All you have to do is go to fabletics.com slash love to take advantage of this deal right now. Again, that's fabletics.com slash love to get two leggings for only $24. Also, make sure you enter your email address when you take the style quiz as you'll receive exclusive discounts and the inside scoop about new collections that they've released that they haven't released yet. Again, last time, fabletics.com slash love. Terms and conditions do apply. Well, now that we've gotten in shape, child, and we got in shape with our <laughs> and we menstrual do. cups, mm-hmm. and we did a little drawing, I think that that was so helpful. So now I want to talk about some questions. Yes. Okay, we're going to start with good. mine, okay? <laughs> uh, and then we'll, I only got like a few um, listener questions, but I okay. think that this is a question people have and don't realize they have. Um, but this happens to me every single month. And so I've been trying to figure out, is this like just me or is this like a thing? And that is what I have termed period poop and period farts. So every month. So this is what happens. This is good. good. (laughs) Every month I either get pre period poop and pre period Mm -hmm. fart or like during my actual Mm -hmm. cycle, I'm having like constant gas and constant pooping and i'm not this is like tmi but we're here now child but i'm not one of those people like my husband uh, he poops every day Mm -hmm. like most people poop every day i'm not one of those people that poops every day i'm like it like three four days and then i'll poop um that's just normal to me so don't be trying to come for me i've just always (laughs) been that way i've never been a person that poops every day so when Mm -hmm. i do poop like every day i'm like what the what is going on like Mm -hmm. this is not Mm -hmm. normal Mm -hmm. for me and i've realized that it's always around my like right Mm -hmm. leading up to my side it's always like before during and then it stops yes so what is that why is my body betraying me this way so there's there's actually two reasons behind that um so hormones actually affect something called gut motility okay so the way in which food moves throughout your gut and that is beneficial in pregnancy when progesterone is super high so that you're absorbing as as much as possible for your fetus okay hold on explain to us what the hormone progesterone does so progesterone actually basically progesterone 
it when it acts on the intestines, it actually slows kind of the the way in which food is moving throughout your intestines. Okay. And it allows you to absorb as much as you can for your baby. So that's just during pregnancy. But when you are having your period, it's a rise and fall of these hormones. What happens right before your period is a drop off of progesterone. Okay. And so that kind of slowing of that gut motility kind of has a chance to pick up. Additionally, when you're having your cycle, the uterus releases inflammatory markers. The uterus is right behind the bladder and literally right next to the intestines mm. or the large bowel. And so that causes you to have those kind of inflamed, kind of almost like an inflammatory bowel syndrome mm. sort of piece of a picture during your cycle. So things that can help with that would be anti-inflammatory medications helps with cramps because your cramps are primarily caused by those inflammatory markers and it decreases the inflammatory markers so that can actually improve the overall effect on your gut. That's what that. is an example of an inflammatory? <laughs> give me a, <laughs> an give an a whole <laughs> prescription. <laughs> so an anti-inflammatory, um, an NSAID, so a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug would be your ibuprofens, okay. your Motrins, your Advils, not your Tylenols. And so people will say, oh, I took Tylenol for my period, it didn't really help. Um, because the actual kind of issue or the cause of the pain with periods tends to be more inflammatory in nature, and Tylenol doesn't, the mechanism of action of Tylenol is not such to prevent inflammation. Oh, that was really great. So then my next question is, I also get really bad, and I know this is really common for a lot of women, um, back aches, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like really, yes. I don't get cramps. I get gas, poop, and back aches. <laughs> yeah. So what causes back aches? So some people have more pain in their back than more um, in the front. It can be one, the orientation of your uterus, but the actual ligaments and support of the uterus and the nerve endings that kind of, um, I guess, are affected by cramping, they just can kind of have like referred pain to your back. So some women also have more labor pains in their back too. Mm. Um, so that's just related to the nerve endings of the cervix and the lower portion of the uterus. And when the, there's contracting involved, because the uterus is a muscle, mm -hmm. so it's going to be contracting, then that pain can be kind of referred. And so you can feel it in your lower back and the front part of your abdomen. We kind of label all of that as menstrual cramps. So those all kind of count as dysmenorrhea or pain with periods or menstrual cramps. Oh man, that was really good. Okay, so that was really, like, that was actually really helpful. So when you say referred uh, pain, mm -hmm. what you're referring to is that the pain is supposed to be here? Like, what are you right. actually saying? So referred pain means pain that is the actual origin of the pain is in one place and you feel it somewhere else. Uh, Does that kind of make sense? Got it. And so um, you can have pain... Uh, that's actually at your diaphragm, but it's referred to your shoulder because that nerve runs that course. So, oh, so I'm trying to think when I was pregnant if I had felt like I had back labor, but honestly, I had another type of period. <laughs> So we're not going to go okay. down that route. Okay. okay. So then, okay, so we talked about my period poop, period fart. One of the things that um, also came up, I saw this online as actually from one of the ladies that I follow. And um, she was saying she has like seven day period. She had really bad cramps. And so mm -hmm. she started taking wild yam and chaste. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it like shortened her period to like three days and she like stopped having really bad cramps and I was like yo listen sign me up <laughs> and so I have been going actually back and forth on mm -hmm. like whether I'm gonna buy this and try it so what are your thoughts on things like that like can sure. we actually control I don't know if control is a good word but like try to manage the length of our period, mm -hmm. the intensity, like all of those sure. things. Um, so there are some ways in which you can manage, shorten, um, control your periods. Now to speak to the yam mm -hmm. and the kind of the supplements or so, a lot of those supplements are going to be things, the, the term is phytoestrogens, um, which are just plant derived kind of um, products that have like an estrogen biological effect. Those would not meaningfully shorten a period okay. in my opinion because if you're applying estrogen estrogen in theory it's supposed to kind of thicken the lining so earlier applied application of estrogen possibly could alter the period but would it reliably shorten it if you're taking it perpetually no if you're taking it during your cycle alone maybe but the trouble is um, these aren't 
FDA regulated, the dosing is not very clear. And so you see things in the literature like liver toxicity when it's not mm. taken appropriately. And so I think the hesitation from um, the medical world is this isn't regulated and isn't um, studied for this indication. We don't know all of the negative sure. potential effects, but there's great options otherwise. So, okay, tell us course, about those, girl. Um, we have all of our hormonal options, specifically like our um, birth control pills mm. and vaginal rings and other kind of um, modalities in which we can actually shorten or regulate your cycles. Um, even taking anti-inflammatory medicines, which we just discussed, mm -hmm. can actually decrease your bleeding um, when you have heavy bleeding. And so there are other medications that you can take. I don't necessarily recommend taking supplements in an, um, I guess, an unmonitored fashion to shorten your cycle. Does it make sense? Might it work anecdotally? Yes. But are there some risks that you could be taking that I can't quite quantify? Yes. Which is why you won't have most physicians endorsing something like that. Because I can't endorse what I can't explain. Right. That was good. Um, ooh, that was low key a word too. I can't, I can't endorse what I can't explain. Okay, last topic that I want to talk about, I think, is menopause. Oh God, yeah. So we get <laughs> lots of questions, or I've received lots of questions on, like, walk me through menopause, mm -hmm. hot flashes, mm. how it affects, and I don't know if you could speak to like how menopause affects my sex life and my oh, libido yeah. and like Absolutely. even like your period, how that affects like your libido and mm -hmm. how you're feeling, like maybe you're feeling frisky or maybe you're getting depressed or maybe your hormones are like completely raging and yeah. you're just upset. Um, I've even noticed for me, I don't consider myself, well, I never previously had considered myself a super moody person but as i've gotten older i mm -hmm. feel like i've definitely gotten more moody and mm -hmm. i def shut up kevin fredericks <laughs> and i definitely um feel like even just recently like i was like i, I was just like um, well kev was telling me that i was like emotional and i was like i don't even like i don't even know why and i'm like oh maybe because my period is about to start but i've never been that person yeah so like how you're like I don't know if it changes with age, if it mm -hmm. can change. Like, girl, tell us why There's the so things. Much. Those are a lot of great questions. <laughs> kind of all into so I'm going to start with menopause. So menopause is defined as kind of the permanent cessation of periods. The permanent? Okay. The permanent cessation. Cessation of, of periods. periods. Okay. And so we actually um, diagnose it when a woman has gone with more than a year without periods. The average age of menopause. It has to menopause, be a year. It has to be a year. Mm -hmm. The average age of menopause is 51. Okay. Can someone go through menopause early? Um, yes. Um, so you can go through menopause early in the sense that you can have something called um, premature ovarian insufficiency, which I do see patients with that. And so they're literally like 17 year old girls whose bodies are like, nope, I'm done. And they can go through hot flashes and those sorts of things. So the hot flashes actually occur because, and the thought is, it's very complex, but because we're I guess replacing estrogen treats hot flashes, it has to do with the loss of estrogen. Mm. So the estrogen levels are falling, um, and that is why hot flashes take place. And they're actually termed hot flushes in the literature, or we call them vasomotor symptoms. And it is like a heat coming from your neck into your head, and they can last for like one to five minutes. They can be daily for the majority of women, and they can impact your sleep and obviously your sanity and a number of factors. Wait, it's coming from your neck? It, well, it feels like it originates from the base of the body, like the, the neck kind of core and like the bottom of the head is what mm. most women say mm. and it just kind of rises they can be like you know physically sweating get very clammy kind of get very anxious um, and it typically lasts one to five minutes and there's it's very complex the kind of regulatory centers in the brain are not working as well um, but it can be super super impactful to women who are menopausal and some people like said you know oh this only lasts six in the first six months to two years but it can last a lot longer up to like 10 years wow and so yes women are wanting to take some more medication or something to improve the symptom because it's significant one of the other most um common symptoms is kind of the vaginal uh, dryness oh my um, gosh that was menopause. one of my questions <laughs> it is significant it's very real because of the loss of estrogen estrogen is what allows allows the vaginal mucosa to kind of um, have that lubrication that's very natural and when you remove it you do have vaginal dryness that can make um, intercourse very painful oh girl hold on um, which is a whole thing it's a whole thing 
Oh my gosh, I think I have a question, but okay. <laughs> uh, I want you to finish this because I don't want people yelling at me that I didn't let you finish your thought. But before we finish, or we do finish, yes, I yes. want to tell you about Open Fit. Listen, y'all, Hot Girl Summer is over, mm-hmm. but Fine Girl Fall is here. Oh, I just made that up that right now. Up. That was that was a I whole word. So, <laughs> fine girl fall is here. So, what that mean? Listen, let go of the goals that you may have had in the summer. It's done. It's over. Fall is here. Start a fresh. Start a new. We are in a new quarter. Let's end 2019 with a bang by accomplishing your weight loss goals. Mm. And it's so much more than just weight loss. It's more right. about like how you feel about yourself. It is so much bigger than just how do I look? It is a mental thing. You will show up to work better. You will be a mother. Mother, you will be a better employee. You will be a better you when you feel good about mm-hmm. yourself. And what is great about Open Fit is that it takes the complexity out of losing weight and getting fit. It is a brand new, super simple streaming service that allows you to work out from the comfort of your living room in as little as 10 minutes a day listen to me you have 10 minutes and if you don't you should you need to make yourself a priority and find 10 minutes for yourself what i love about open fit is that you can sculpt your body in the convenience of your own you don't even have to go to the gym girl just roll over turn on the tv and actually get up out the bed don't just stare at the tv some places can only sell classes and packages that you can't make every day but open fit will bring the class to you open fit has changed the way i work out and texting the code love that's just l-o-v-e to 30 30 30 you can join us for a fitness journey personalized just for you right now during the open fit 30 day challenge my listeners get a special extended 30 day free try membership to open fit when you text love to 30 30 30 you will get full access to open fit all the workouts and nutrition information totally free again just text love that's l-o-v-e to 30 30 30 don't forget standard message and data rates may apply I'm going to let you finish your whole thought on menopause. Okay. And then I want to um, go back a little bit and we can talk about um, dryness yes. specifically yes. associated with your period. And then um, Kevin just asked me, which is an important topic, sex on your period. So maybe we'll end with those two things. So finish your whole okay. thought on menopause. OK, so the menopause thought really has to do with the significant effects that it has on your body. Um, the vaginal dryness component Um, really informs, you know, sexual health and all of those factors. And so we have a number of ways that we treat that. We treat the vasomotor symptoms or the hot flushes with systemic estrogen, typically. That is the most um, effective way to treat it. Uh, Sometimes that's combined with progesterone, and that just depends on some of your factors, like if you have a uterus present or if you've had a hysterectomy, you're fine with just estrogen alone. And if you just have vaginal dryness as your primary issue, we actually have vaginal estrogen. So it can be in like a, um, a pill form that's inserted into the vagina kind of a vaginal cream um, and that really helps wait 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 wait. you can insert a whole pill into Mm -hmm. your and then what it it just dissolves dissolves Mm -hmm. really i know fascinating yeah because the vagina is actually very absorbent but it keeps it stays mostly within the vaginal mucosa which is what responds to it and doesn't necessarily go all throughout your body so estrogen is not a benign medication Mm. it impacts your propensity or the likelihood that you might form a clot in your blood systems oh wow Um, and so that's something that you definitely want to be aware of which is why there's a lot of hesitation towards hormone replacement not necessarily in our reproductive age young girls but when you your body has said i am done with estrogen and we introduce it back it does increase some of your cardiovascular risk so you have to be very careful oh wow i didn't know that yes, there's a lot a lot of um just controversy and discussion around that because if we're treating something that's a lifestyle factor and i may be increasing your risk for something you know super serious mm. is it worth it now the course of women who are hot flashing you know say yes it is mm-hmm. which i believe we should listen to them and the whole point of medicine is i counsel you on the risks and you make the choice if that risk is important enough to outweigh so you know, or the benefits are important enough to outweigh the risks oh it, this puts women in a very uh, predicament though it absolutely does because yes. you're at a point where your body is saying enough no more mm-hmm. but what you're what i heard you say earlier is that um estrogen is what 
is the cure, so to speak, yes, to hot flashes. Absolutely. But then it's also detrimental to reintroduce it to it your body. Be, it can be dangerous in higher doses, and it can increase your overall risk. Now, an increase of risk doesn't mean sure. absolute, sure. right? You know, if you have a genetic family history of breast cancer, you're at an increased risk of breast cancer. It doesn't mean you're having mm -hmm. it. But we know that you're at a higher risk compared to someone who doesn't have that factor. It's appropriate to tell you so. You know, so it it is it's a balancing act. So, what is? Are there any estrogen substitutions that yes. will? Okay, <laughs> like I'm trying to figure out. Absolutely. Like I would feel hopeless. Yes. No, no, no. I mean, and a lot of women do. So there are what we found is um, some of the antidepressant medications. They are labeled SSRIs or SNRIs, and the long the name is very long. But ultimately, some of those actually do help with hot flashes. And we don't actually know why, but it has to do with some of the um, serotonin activity and how that informs the hot flashes themselves. And so those are totally free of hormones and they're great for women who have hot flashes and want to avoid estrogen. And we, they're, they've been shown to work better than placebo. So work better than a sugar pill mm -hmm. that I give you and say, this is something that's supposed to help with mm -hmm, your hot flashes, mm -hmm. and then give you the actual medis medication in a similar mm -hmm. fashion. This is something that's supposed to help with your hot flashes, and I, I see who actually is impacted. And those are the studies that we really like to review because it removes all the bias. And so what I caution women with the phytoestrogens and those sorts of things, if there is no study where that was done, all you have is somebody who believes that this has helped them. And that can be a total placebo effect. I can believe if I walk out outside and do a little bit of a, a dance or so it might rain and it might actually rain but that was predicted anyway that doesn't mean like the correlation isn't causation that doesn't mean that I've truly proven that this is a scientifically you know effective mm -hmm. um, medication oh that, that was sense. good yeah no that was really good um, oh man Sometimes you be looking like, oh, menopause, no period, yay. But then you inherit a whole host of There's other issues. Things. But, I mean, I still know women that re rejoice in menopause. They mm -hmm. do. Once they've cleared that kind of um, the hot flushes and those sorts of things and they found out how they're going to manage the vaginal dryness or so, I mean, they do find it to be a glorious time. I think Oprah just did a, a talk about her menopause oh. all the time. And, and, you know, and people are, are talking about it positively, but it is an important phase of a woman's life. Oh, yeah. Okay. So then you briefly, or I, we talked a little bit about um, how menopause can affect your libido and your yes. sex drive. Yes. And so how does that also work regarding like women who are still actively having mm -hmm. a period? Like how do all of those things relate? Right. Um, and so some women actually find that maybe around ovulation or around the time that they're releasing an egg or even around their period um, that they just are more inclined to want sex their libido is just a little bit higher and that has to do with the rises and falls of hormones and it makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint that you would want to be sexually active and be close to your partner to try to procreate when you are actually fertile so that makes sense um, other studies are, are showing. I didn't even think about that. But that makes <laughs> evolution total sense. evolution. Once you, I mean, I'm telling you, evolution wants you to have babies. Um, yeah. And so what? What does kind of make sense is if I'm giving you a medication like a birth control pill, for instance, and I'm just regulating these so that those fluctuations are not taking place, some people are like, my libido just isn't there. I'm just very, you know, very steady. And I kind of liken that to like a thermostat. So if a room is kind of um, rising and falling, super hot, super cold, yes, you're going to have more extremes of, of temperatures. And that may be spicy or you might be really, really averse mm -hmm. to sex, but you're going to notice those extremes way more. Um, if you're just kind of regulating things, it's really middle of the road. So maybe you don't have those spikes, but you also don't have those negative things too. Mm -hmm. And so you can overcome that with a you know an active partner. There's a lot of factors that kind of contribute to a woman's arousal and her desire to have sex and orgasms and those sorts of things. If you have a partner that is willing, you should be able to overcome that. That was good because a lot of it, um, <laughs> when you say a lot of factors, I'm thinking you're thinking of like the mental yes, part of the it. the intellectual, the emotional. The emotional part, which yes. is going to more impact a woman than it is for a man, which is why there's um, no pink Viagra pill because mm. we don't work and operate the mm. same. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's a whole thing. That <laughs> I feel that on an emotional level. I wish yes. someone would create the pink Viagra. Um, okay, so then the next thing while we're on this topic of sex yes. is people, Melissa, that um, adverse to having sex on their period. Okay. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Where does this come from? I think I know where it comes from, but child, tell me your thoughts on okay. it. Okay. So I think people are averse to having sex in their period because there's a world and a culture of period shame in general. Yes. And so if you feel that you need to hide your period slash hide yourself, that is the exact opposite of feeling sexy and wanting to be, you know, held and touched. And so, so those are like 
the exact opposite of the spectrum in a sense. So one, we have to overcome that as women. I'm still sexy, you know, yes, I'm on my period. My partner should understand that that's a normal physiologic process and shouldn't be weirded out by mm -hmm. that um, from a maturity standpoint. And so if your partner's weirded out, you know, there's modifiable things you can do there. Um, but, you know, modify accordingly. Um, so the actual process of having sex in your period, nothing has changed right, about right, your right. vagina itself. Mm -hmm. It may be more lubricated in a sense if there's, you know, some the mucus and, and kind of blood that's already present. I think another, um, I guess, con to sex on your period would just be, I mean, it just makes a mess. I mean, there's going to be a mess. So anyone can plan for a mess. You can lay down a towel or some sort of, um, you know, have you can have sheets that are specific to having sex in your period if you feel so moved that may be darker or something of that sort. Um, <laughs> and all the guys are going to start buying some dark sheets. I'm like, look what I got. Um, but I think the most important factor is a woman knowing that she is worthy of being desired mm -hmm. even while she's on her period. Mm. This is a normal process. There's nothing about you that is wrong, broken, shameful, or should be hidden. Mm -hmm. Your partner should still desire you in the same way. That was really good. Um, so leading up to your um, period, and you talked about this briefly when you're in menopause about vaginal dryness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am most definitely one of those people. And it and, and it's like hit or miss, oh, to yeah. be honest. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's like every single time, this is what I'm going through, help me. Uh, but when it does occur, I'm like, oh, this is so annoying. Yes. So why, what happened? It seems to me that maybe estrogen is the cause, child, because I'm about to start blaming everything <laughs> on even estrogen, oh. okay? <laughs> Even that's it. Eve and estrogen. They really are that's to blame it. for a lot of um, And men. Yeah. <laughs> so how, what is going on in our bodies? And then like, what's a way to, I honestly feel like there is no remedy for this situation. Oh. So tell us like, what happens? Yes. Why is this happening? Yes. And then what we can do to like, minimize or prevent. Absolutely. So um, definitely estrogen plays a role. Some women will see that they have um, significant vaginal dryness, especially having a baby, when they are breastfeeding um, because they're not actually having those rises and falls of estrogen. They typically aren't actually even ovulating during that time if they're exclusively breastfeeding, and so you can have vaginal dryness during that time, and that's separate from menopause. Um, ways to overcome that, honestly, you really just need to use lubrication. I mean, that really makes a big difference, and these are just, they could be water paste. Okay, yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So are you saying... I want to be clear when you say like lubrication as an option, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, I'm not just talking about vaginal di dryness in response to sex. Right. I'm talking about walking down the street and it's uncomfortable. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're mm -hmm. saying lubrication is still? Still lubrication okay. can be helpful. So typically there isn't vaginal dryness um, without intercourse and penetration. Because we talked about this, the vagina bit kind of being the internal portion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or so, um, that shouldn't cause meaningful discomfort inside okay. the dryness itself. Now, of course, you can always apply lubrication if you feel like, oh, you know, this is just a little bit dry. Inside, so, right. Inside. I'm not talking about the inside. the external yep. portion, mm -hmm. if there's dryness there, that to me is a little bit different. So when you think about the external portion of the vagina, or the vulva, mm -hmm. and the hair bearing portion, if there is irritation or dryness, people don't always moisturize that part of the body as well as they should. And this is still skin. Like this is still I skin, didn't know it should there's be still hair. <laughs> and so you can apply moisture there, especially for young girls who have like eczema. So eczema is going to affect kind of flexure points mm -hmm. and cut sometimes in the growing, it can be under the arms that. or mm -hmm. in the elbows, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. And so you typically see a lot of young girls who have other dermatoses or issues with their skin having issues there as well. And so you can do some sort of moisturizing there. Also not using super harsh soaps that are super super drying sure. and kind of using, not using temperatures that are too hot. Because very hot water actually kind of dries the skin mm -hmm. a lot more I too. Use a lot and so those water. are some of the things that you can do. Um, a lot of the times it's not wrong to talk to your provider about it and point to an area like, this is what this looks like. This is how dry it is and see, you know, what possibilities are occurring. <laughs> Yo tengo una pregunta. Yes. <laughs> Okay, next question, because I want to make sure that I'm clear on what I'm saying. Yeah. Actually, as I said, I was like, I don't know that I'm speaking right. So I'm not talking about... The growing. Uh, um, right. I'm right. not talking about vulva dryness. I'm not talking about skin dryness. Yes. I'm talking about actual, like, 
inside and i don't want to say vagina meaning like canal because look but at just me more knowing the, all the words the, but like on the flip side of the the labia vulva the okay, labia okay, is okay. the correct term thank you uh-huh. um there is dryness yes, okay and so that causes um chafing yeah, it's basically, okay. it's mm-hmm. uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. They, like it just be dry. So for that, you can do like a barrier cream, like an Aquaphor, a Vaseline, just something to apply oh. a barrier there, so that those dry surfaces aren't touching. You don't necessarily need a true lubrication in a sense because mm-hmm. that's not going to meaningfully improve anything, and you don't need to just be moist down there for just no reason. But you can put like an Aquaphor. Um, okay. You can, I mean, some of the the barrier creams used for babies, you can actually apply to that area too. Obviously, if it's gentle enough for a baby, it's typically gentle enough for an adult. But like an Aquaphor Vaseline would be sufficient. Not like a deodorant necessarily, not a particular balm, nothing that's too scented because you don't want to apply that to that Girl, area. even when you just said Aquaphor and Vaseline, I'm like, I'm scared to put anything. No, no, no. I totally understand. And, and definitely not truly inside. Right, right, right. But if it's something on the ex- the external portion, that's absolutely safe. Okay, that mm-hmm. was actually very helpful because child be me. This was one of y'all questions by way of me. Um, okay, so I think we talked about, I want to make sure I go over everything. We talked about the cycles and stages. Mm-hmm. Uh, why do my hormones go out? Let, let's talk about that. Why do our hormones go out of control? Mm-hmm. Um, and we experience, and I think maybe you just mentioned it because it's just it's our a hormones. Rise and fall. It's just That's the what rise and causes fall. the cycle. And so because those hormones. Why does it feel so like concentrated? Like mm-hmm. three I- to four days before mm-hmm. and then during and then it stops. Because those are when the most striking changes occur. Mm. So there's a slow rise to estrogen and then a slow rise to progesterone. And when you're really feeling the meaningful differences is when there's a drop off. Because, I mean, it really is a, like a striking difference. So that kind of slower rise and plateau is not going to be as noticeable as a drop off. Mm-hmm. And your body responds to that and your mood responds to that. That was good. I didn't realize it was the, mm-hmm. the drop off. So I'm about to leave me alone. I'm dropping off. <laughs> <laughs> there surges, there falls. Leave me alone during all of them. <laughs> and then why it's so interesting to me that as women that it affects us so differently. Mm-hmm. So while our bodies are kind of mimicking the same natural mm-hmm. occurrences, mm-hmm. Uh, you're angry, I'm sad, I'm frisky. <laughs> like it's yes. interesting to me that we, yes. like everyone is responding to that so differently. Is that like personality based? Is that? Yeah. I think it's personality based and just environmental based. Mm-hmm. And so um, there's some people who are like, oh, just now that I'm older, you know, I respond so much, like I'm way more anxious or I'm way more, um, you know, afraid or something like that. Well, and when you were a child, you have fewer things to worry about in general. You have fewer responsibilities, fewer deadlines, fewer things. And so I sense. think a lot about your actual life and your stressors and your environment have changed. And then your personality has kind of just clarified itself. It's probably more mature and your Ooh, overall insight was good. into your personality is more, um, it's just sharpened. And so when I was 12, I didn't realize I was moody. I felt like everyone was being a jerk that day. Like mm-hmm. I was like, people were terrible on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, when you're older, you're like, this is this is me. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I think your insight actually starts to mature and maybe the overall view of how you're perceiving things and um, the way in which you identify the causes of things is a little bit different too. That was good. good. I, I, I I could agree with that. Mm-hmm. And I specifically liked um, that you said your personality clarifies itself. That's, yes. that's a very powerful statement. I really, I like that. Um, and I'm visual. So then I actually can see like things clearing yes. by way of negativity, opinions, mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And just as you get, um, we're totally off topic, but while we're here. <laughs> wow. um, uh, as especially I'm thinking it just again about my own personal journey and how I have like done away with and released a lot of um, outside opinions about who I am, who yes. I should be. And that's again, a clarifying process. Yes. So that was a Which whole is good. visual Which is good. word for me. Uh, we talked about sex on your period. We talked about organic process uh, products, TSS, birth control. Does the pill of Effect fertility. So no, <laughs> and this is a no. great question. So that's a double-sided question. Does the pill affect fertility? 
it is a birth control pill so by virtue of it being a birth control pill it is going to prevent your ability to conceive as long as you're taking it the half-life of a pill is about 24 hours so it only works for 24 hours which is why if you miss your pill you can't get pregnant so it does not have long-term effects and so they've studied this out to about one to two years where they see that that women who stop their pills get pregnant just as quickly as women who were never on pills alone okay and mm. so that's about like 80 percent within a year um, and so there isn't long-term negative fertility effects but it is a birth control pill and anytime we're manipul manipulating your period we typically prevent you from getting pregnant and so yes by virtue of it being a birth control pill I'm affecting your fertility in a transient sense but there's not long-term effects and that's a worry that's very real and a lot of moms come into the office and have that concern grandmothers and it's something that it's not from nowhere you know science has a long-standing history of affecting and manipulating and even stealing mm -hmm. fertility from mm -hmm. women of color from vulnerable populations so it's appropriate to have that kind of healthy suspicion but the pills of today do not meaningfully negatively affect your fertility and it's proven that's good and that um iud is that all birth control so, so that's all birth control the iud as soon as you remove it you are fertile like mm -hmm. as soon i know multiple people who got pregnant before they even had a period after they had their iud removed oh, wow. and because it, it works locally it's just sitting in your uterus there are historical iud's that were very problematic that did damage the uterine lining and did actually cause infertility that is not the iud's of today okay we're taking you at your word. How normal, <laughs> this is one more question that I have, and then I think we've covered like everything on here. Um, how normal is spotting? Okay, so that's a very good question. So spotting is normal in the context of your period. It can precede your period as your period kind of picks up, and then it can kind of follow your period as it kind of drips, drifts off. Intermenstrual spotting, meaning separate from your cycle spotting, is abnormal. It is termed abnormal. It's something that we look into and say, okay, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. um, is there an infectious cause? So sometimes infection can cause you to have some spotting. Is there a trauma cause? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes there can be just a little bit of a trauma, you know, from intercourse or whatever um, that can cause some sort of spotting. Which is not the result of breaking of the hymen. Not at all, no. <laughs> what would um, cause it though just from trauma itself oh yeah trauma itself okay. yeah so if there right. isn't if the vagina is yeah, adequately lubricated you know Wait, with this friction was our vagina. <laughs> um, with certain friction you can't have tearing of the vagina with consensual intercourse and we've seen that before mm -hmm. um but otherwise spotting is not term to be normal unless let's say that you're on the iud and you have spotting that's a very known very common side effect that can be explained by the medication that you're taking that's okay if you're on the pill and you've had some irregularities or you miss a pill or so you can have some spotting that's called you know um, breakthrough bleeding that's normal because i'm trying to manipulate your period and i'm failing in some way shape or form but just your normal period that's not on any hormones kind of having intramenstrual spotting is not normal um and should typically be investigated in some way shape now you might come up with nothing but it is associated with pathological things like infections and other things like that for some women it can be a sign of things like a cervical malignancy um obviously that's not the majority of women but one of the characteristics findings is like postcoital bleeding you know so it's something to consider and definitely something to bring up to your physician not just rub off like oh I'm just a spotter mm -hmm. no that's not normal that's good because I think a lot of times the way I just was like I'm not one of those people that poops every day um, you <laughs> like, kind of like will self-diagnose and yes. say this is what's normal for me correct and so you try to you know like downplay the concern mm -hmm. by saying no this is just what happens I'll, I'll give an example even i get um blood infections all the time mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. a chronic person and so this last time i had some spotting and i was like okay maybe i should go to the doctor <laughs> and so when i went to the doctor and i'm like telling her like this is how often i get them you know whatever and she was like er, not okay <laughs> Ma'am, why, why is this your first time here? Why have you? And I was like, well, you know, I just, you know, it's just me. It's just kind of what happens. Like, and I thought, mm -hmm. you know, women go through this, whatever. And she was like, so let's talk about how don't ever do that again. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's not normal. And it could be something like structurally wrong with yes. you. And beyond that, if this lingers, it can turn into a kidney yes. infection. And yes, I was exactly. like, oh. Well, good thing I'm here. <laughs> My bad. Yes. Um, and what's so funny is I took that. She like gave me this medicine, whatever. And then I was like spotting. And I was like, now I'm totally freaking <laughs> out because I thought this was normal. Now it's not. And it carried on for like seven days. And I was like completely freaked out. And she was like, well, come back. If it's like 12 days, you might have a problem. Yeah. And then it stops. It and I was like, oh, so this is why I be self-diagnosing myself because now I look like boo-boo to foo. Uh, but I think it is so important that we... Um, 
uh, hold off on self-diagnosing, right. web MDing ourselves, and yes. allow ourselves to go to the doctor and yes. allow them to tell us, you right. know, and this it's is not, what's wrong. It's not to suggest that there's no insight in a patient. You know, the patient, one mm -hmm. of the teachings in medical school is like, the patient's always right in the sense that the patient is always carrying the answer to their issue. The diagnosis is there. They have the most information about it. You must listen to the patient and what's going on. Um, however, that partnering with the physician is really the opposite optimal type of um, relationship that equals, you know, the best outcomes. So when you're self-diagnosing and self-treating, it can delay your actual treatment. And so, you know, you can have worsening of an underlying infection and have something that was totally preventable mm -hmm. because of a fear or a delay to getting your, to your provider. Oh, that was really good. Okay, do you have any other last tidbits, questions, or even like advice maybe that you want to give um, to women or to women with daughters or even mm -hmm. maybe a husband, a man out there that has a daughter and he's exactly. like, I have no idea what's what because I ain't never had to go through this. <laughs> and like how to have these conversations and maybe um, advice on conversations if you have a hesitancy or a fear like sure. how to have um, a productive conversation with your your gynae sure um, so one I want my patients to to know that I'm really there to take care of them and I cannot address problems that you do not discuss mm. and so if there's something that you're holding within you I will never fully treat that if you're not open and honest with me so if there's something that's that's bothering you that's you know just stealing sleep from you at night, please, please just be open about, about it. Your provider should not be judging you. Your provider should be there to help you. And we cannot help what we don't, um, what we're not told. So that's one, just kind of that open honesty and understanding that when you come to see me, I am not judging you. The girls will be like, oh my goodness, I didn't shave. I just don't know. This is so, this is so weird. You're looking at me. I am a physician. You are seeing a qualified healthcare provider. They should be taking care of you. This is not some, you know, social situation. This is medicine. Mm -hmm. And it really does take a different lens at that time. Um, an additional point that I want to make just about parents, fathers, any caregiver of a young girl, these are the conversations that matter. Make sure that you're open, that you let your daughter know or your child know, you know, this is something you can talk to me about. And it's not that you want them to be talking to everyone about. Like, there's some appropriate discretion to be had. But if they cannot talk to you, that's when they're caring about all of these things and learning from their peers who are also misinformed mm -hmm. or learning from the Internet, which is also inaccurate. And that's when they're they're getting all of this information that um, you are unaware of and they're building up all of these misconceptions and fears that you don't have the opportunity to kind of intervene on. Another point that I'd like to say, and this is just a, a personal thing that I'm trying to do, I'm pairing with a colleague of mine who's mm -hmm. also pediatric, um, an adolescent gynecologist, to create a series that's a um, adolescent sexual health and kind of self-esteem series that's church friendly. And I think that's so important because the church can be one of those areas in which we are not able to discuss normal physiologic processes and the appropriate ways to um, to deal with sexual pressures and self-esteem issues. And I think when we normalize these things in a variety of settings, specifically in the church, that's when we do better. That's when we have better conversations. That's when we make better choices and we can live better lives. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's all about communication, removing the misconceptions and just talking and being open and honest. Um, and just being proud of who you are um, and understanding that you have a right to understand your body and a right to make choices about your body that are based on accurate information. That was yeah. great. That's all my last one. All right. Lot, so. That was a lot, but we love it. Thank you so very much. Please tell everyone um, where they can find you and follow you on social Absolutely. media and <laughs> remind them where they where you um, practice. Because yes. what Dr. King wrote was like, where is she at? I <laughs> want her to be my doctor. Yes, yes, so in case people have children, yes. then they want them um, to come see you or they have questions. They're like, love what you're doing. Please let them know all of that. That's a great point. So you can find me on Instagram um, at the 
period doctor, no underscores or, or dots or anything. It's really just at the period doctor. Um, and I am in a fellowship program right now. And so I'm not actively seeing patients that are specifically my own. I'm actually going to, when I graduate from my practice, um, join with my father in the Georgia area. And that's going to be in um, the summer of 2020. So look out. I'll definitely post and let people know when I'm accepting patients when my profile is open. But at this point, most of my communication is going to be, you know, on social media from an educational standpoint. It never, of course, replaces seeing your healthcare provider. Right. But as soon as you can see me, I will let you know. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Anything else you want to add? No, just thank no, you for this. Thank this is you. great. I appreciate this platform. Yes. I'm a huge fan. So this thank is so you. Fun. Thank you um, so very much, Dr. Yes. Chambers, for being here with us and educating us on all things period related. I got all of my questions out. So thank you so very much. Um, I hope that you guys are enjoying the Four Women series. I have one more guest. Her name is Dr. Jessica Shepard. I'm actually going to have a conversation with her right after we film. Um, and we'll be talking about breast exams and um, cancer and just some of everything. I'm really excited about that. So that will be next week and that will close out the four women only series. And then we're going to move into some finance stuff and some other mm. stuff. So I'm super excited. Oh, um, if you don't know, I don't know where you have been, but we have a love hour conference coming in July 9th, 10th and 11th in Atlanta, Georgia. Registration is open today, right now. Link will be in the somewhere where you can find links. <laughs> uh, we have wonderful speakers lined up. I'm super, super excited about it. VIP is sold out, but with your general admission, you do get access to all of the things, just not the, the um, just not the um, vow renewal service. <laughs> and then we also have our curated date night coming to Charlotte, North Carolina on December 8th. Tickets are on sale right now. We're about 40% sold out. I might be lying. It might be like 35% uh, percent sold out. So if you're interested in buying your tickets, the link will be where links be. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much to our audience for joining us. Until the next time, bye.